This farm was Robert Burns' new hope, the place he chose to start again, the place where the poet would bring up his family. Burns even had a safety net, something to calm any insecurities about the farming life. The commission in the excise that he'd long petitioned the great Glen Cairn for finally came through, and what a relief it was. My dear friend, I know not how the word excise man will sound in your ears. I too have seen the day when my auditory nerves would have felt very delicately on this subject, but a wife and children are things which have a wonderful power in blunting those kind of sensations. Fifty pounds a year for life and a provision for widows and orphans you will allow is no bad settlement for a poet. Ellisland in some ways represents the last attempt to live the kind of life that his father would have liked him to live, to be an effective farmer, an effective Christian and a good family man. It's the part of Burns' life where I feel closest to him in some ways. Because writers have all that public life of signings and public events and um, even in his day, the local fame. Everybody in Mocklin had known Rabbi Burns. But he'd come away from all that. He'd come away from the lads and the hubbub of life and the drinking and the reputation and come to this table. He'd come in after a long day working for the excise and he'd been drying himself beside this very oven here and trying to write. And you suddenly get a sense of this phenomenon that he's come to seem to us. This phenomenon was really just a man. Perhaps this genius, for all his love of freedom, ultimately was a victim of the very opposite of freedom. He was imprisoned by duty and responsibility. Yet amazingly, he turned himself into the 18th century equivalent of a hit factory when it came to the production of songs. Besides my farm business, I ride on my excise matters at least 200 miles every week. I have not by any means given up the muses. You will see in the third volume of Johnson Scott's songs that I have contributed my might there. Every hour that passes, oh, it signifies the worth of man. Where no for the lassies, oh, King Grau the Rashies, oh. I've come to a homely gathering of musicians who have a lot of time for Burns' devotion to song. The terror I spent, I spent among the lassies, oh. A lot of people have written, you know, through the 19th century into the 20th century, what was he doing, wasting his time, we could have had more good poetry in those last years. Um, I mean, basically, music and the whole notion of song was important to Burns from the very start. Yeah. And so his early life, he did, he did dabble in some songwriting, but the first publications included mostly poetry. Yes. And it's really the trip to Edinburgh and a chance meeting, or perhaps it was a fateful meeting with James Johnson, the, the publisher that kind of provided a catalyst to Burns becoming really obsessed to, yes. to all intents and purposes with songs in the last years of his life. I, spent among the last days I am engaged in assisting an honest Scotch enthusiast, a friend of mine who is an engraver and has taken it into his head to publish a collection of all our songs set to music. This, you will easily guess, is an undertaking exactly to my taste. I have collected begged, borrowed and stolen all the songs I could meet with. The influences come from a whole variety of places. They come from him listening to people sing and noting things down. Mm -hmm. They come from wee fragments that he finds in a whole wide variety of publications. And I think we often think he's, he's kind of the man of the folk and he's keen to note down people singing folk songs in the field or at, mm -hmm. or at convivial gatherings, which indeed he did. But he's also incredibly well read in terms of old song publications. Should all the acquaintance be forgot? And he pinches and steals and chooses a phrase from here or a chorus mm -hmm. from there, and that just Should inspires him. All the acquaintance be forgot, and old lang syne. There's not really far off about 400 songs that 
we can kind of prove he had his hands on. Old Lang Syne was already the title of a song. Burns took it. He set it to new music and transformed it into something magical. And to him, it was for offering to posterity as a gift. Burns himself never made a penny from it. He seemed far more reluctant than you might expect to charge them for it. I mean, he didn't rush towards them with, you know, invoices. <laughs> uh, quite the opposite. I mean, why was that? Did he see it as a national service, as something to be given to the nation? I think he did. I think he felt very strongly about that. He, he didn't seek funding or, you know, any kind of payment from Johnson. And it's funny that, that Burns' critics, after his death, have you know laid the blame very much at the editor's doors and said, you know, those horrible men made him do all that work and never paid a penny. As if they it. exploited him. As if they exploited him, but the correspondence doesn't suggest that at all. By late 1790, Burns was in perfect voice, and he was about to stun the world of poetry again. Something extraordinary was brewing in his imagination, and like so many of his poems, it's kept alive today by performance. Good morning. Good morning. Right, we're going to do Tam today. Tell me about Tam Ashanta. Who wrote it? So let's just go for the beginning. First four or five when lines. Chapman Billies leave the Who's street and Ruthie Neighbours' Neighbours, neighbours meet, as market days are wearing Chapman late and late. folk begin to you tack the gate, while we sit boozing at the nappy and getting foo and unco happy, we think now in the Lang Scots miles, the mosses, waters, slaps and styles that lie between us and our home, where sits our sulky, sullen dame. Gathering her brows like gathering storm, nursing her wrath to keep it warm. So she's nursing her wrath to keep it warm. So do you think she's sitting at home going, Oh, I can't wait for Tam to come back, I'm going to make his dinner, we're going to watch his tenders, it's going to be fantastic. No. What's she waiting to do? Kill him. Kill him? Well, I hope not. Maybe give him a good slap over the ear. Right, okay. So he comes outside and it's raining. It's windy. And the sound is really loud! <laughs> that night, a child might understand. The deal had business on his hand. How did Tamashanter come about? Well, very simply, Burns was having dinner with Captain Francis Gross, the famous antiquarian, who was collecting stories of Scotland for his book, The Antiquities. Who else did he, sit with? he asked Burns if he had any ideas about buildings that he might take an interest in, and Burns immediately said, Old Alloway Kirk. And who's a Fine, said Gross, but you write me a supernatural story to accompany the picture. Right, so let's get into our groups. The witches over here. Witches over there, and the third group of witches over here. Tam O'Shanter and the horse, Meg, over here. So, Meg is trotting up to the graveyard. Look through the window, Tam. See the devil. Having a good time. The big black dog who's playing the bagpipes and all the witches are dancing. And having a great time and screaming. How Tam stood like in bewitched and thought his very in enriched. Even Satan glowered and fidged foo fain, and hodged and blew wi might and main, till first, I caper, sin another. Tam tint his reason a' the gither, and roars out, Well done, Cutty Sack! <laughs> and in an instant, all was dark. <laughs> and scarcely had he Maggie rallied, when out the hellish legion sallied, as bees buzz out wi angry fike when plundering herds assail their bike, 
as open pussy's mortal foes when pop she starts before their nose. So what do you think of the graveyard then, in the old graves? It's fantastic, isn't it? <laughs>